The Witch Must Burn, Chapter 6. Glenda's personal chambers looked the, as though a per pink marshmallow had gotten into a losing fight with a cotton candy machine. The walls were lighter version of the ever-present shade of the palace, and the floors were carpeted with thick pattern rugs piled on top of each other, in some places inches thick. Heavy pink velvet drapes hung on either side of the big picture windows, which let in a view of the surrounding countryside through rose-tinted glass. A huge pink canopy bed dominated one corner of the room, where Glinda lounged against a raft of, em of immense ruffled pink pillows. She had let her hair down, and her soft curls framed her heart-shaped face. She looked almost vulnerable, and surprisingly young. Despite what she had put me through, I found myself wondering what she really was she was really like when she wasn't busy being a manipulative, magic-stealing monster. She had to be pretty desperate for friends, if Dorothy was the closest thing she had to something to hang out with. "'You took long enough, Jelia,' she said sweetly. "'You may bring the tray over here.' "'Yes, your eminence,' I said, trying not to trip on the carpet as I crossed the room. "'How are you finding the palace, Jelia?' she asked as she took the tray from me and set it on her lap. "'Was she serious?' I looked at her out of the corner of my eye. Her, fo her face was serene. She was serious. "'It's as lovely as you are, your eminence,' I said ca cautiously. She smiled. "'You are very clever, aren't you, Julia? Tell me honestly, were you happy working with Dorothy?' I kept my eyes on the floor. We were definitely on thin ice. "'What did she want from me?' "'I'm always happy,' I said, and she actually laughed. Look at me, Jillia. Cautiously, I looked up. She was still laughing, holding her bowl of ice cream so carelessly as that it was a danger of spilling onto her dress. Jillia, I know you're not stupid. I know you're not happy. Dorothy is... She paused. Dorothy can be difficult, she said, although I didn't think that was what she had meant to say originally. But I have run her palace, you have run her palace very well, and remained very modest, admirable qualities, and someone with your power. Was this about her machine, or the magic she was mining? I had plenty of practice keeping my expression blank after all the time I'd worked with Dorothy, but something told me Glenda was going to be a lot harder to fool. Perhaps you can be more use of me than I thought, she mused. I looked down at her ice cream, and a sudden frown marred her perfect futures. But this ice cream is melted, Jillia, because you took too long to bring it to me. But your eminence, we were talking. Her frown deepened. Now, Jillia, I don't want to hear your excuses. I want you to do better next time. Is that clear? Yes, your eminence. It won't happen again, I said. Next time I would have to use a spell on her Sunday to keep it cold. No one said anything about a ban on using magic in Glinda's palace. Glinda studied me inside deeply, a sigh that seemed to come all the way from her puffy, feathered, pink, high-heeled slippers dangling from her perfectly manicured, pink, glitter-coated toes. Tell me, Jillia, do you enjoy your job? I blinked. Enjoy, your eminence? I mean, do you find real satisfaction in your work? Like, at the end of the day, do you feel pride in what you've accomplished? Is it meaningful for you to be here? I had no idea how to respond to this. I'm sorry, your evidence. I didn't mean to be disrespectful. It's just that it's my first day and I... Because the thing is, Jillia, I get the sense from you that you don't care. Glinda interrupted, her f fructose sweet voice tinted with genuine sadness. It's as though you're... Just going through the motions. You're clearly very smart and very efficient, but I need you to understand that we're all at the palace because we want to be here, because you, our work is meaningful to us. I give my heart every day to magic, Jillia. At this, Glinda laid her beautifully manicured hands over the bony area of her sternum, and I imagine, and I imagine how's this, also doubtless pink organ. I show up for my work with joy, Jillia, because there simply isn't anything I'd rather do than be Glinda the Good Witch. But you? I think you'd almost rather be anywhere else. Mistakes like this? She indicated the bowl of melted ice cream with a gentle wriggle nod of her golden head. Tell me that you think you're too good to be with us. Don't get me wrong, you're very competent. I need to feel that you care, Jillia. 
I need to see caring from you. Can you do that for me? I, I think so, your eminence, I said utterly confused. I'm sure things were different when you were working for Dorothy, Glinda said, her voice losing some of its gentle sweetness. But here, we don't make mistakes. In her hands, the Sunday bowl began to glow hot red, and the ice cream melted into a steaming swirl. Without changing her expression, Glinda threw the bowl directly at me. I flung up my arms without looking, as if to protect myself, and I felt a strange buzzing surge around me. The air around me shimmered, and to my astonishment the bowl shattered in, in mid-flight, as though it had hit an invisible brick wall. With a series of little pops, the fragments vanished before they hit the floor. A few blobs of pink ice cream hung forlornly in the air before they too disappeared into a faint, sticky noise. I glared and I stared in disbelief, but Glinda was smiling. I thought so, Glinda said. Oh, I had a feeling about you, Delia, and I'm simply never wrong when I have a feeling. I was too startled to keep up my perfect servant act. What happened? In all good time, Glinda said, and this time the gentleness in her voice seemed almost real. I moved too quickly with you this morning. But there's much, much more to you than what meets the eye, and together we're going to find out just how much you can help me. I don't understand, I said. Leave the understanding to me, she said briskly. You're dismissed, Julia. You'll have plenty of time to perfect your education. She waved a hand in my direction and turned back into the window. Knox took one look at me when I finally found my way back to the kitchen and told me I was done working for the day. His demeanor was as gruff as ever, but I thought I saw sympathy in his eyes. What had happened up there? I... To be honest, I'm not sure, I said, and told him everything. Glinda said in niceness, the ice cream, the thing I'd done to somehow make it disappear. When I got to that part, his eyebrows went up. You mean, you did magic? But it wasn't something I did on purpose, I said. Before Dorothy and her rules, everyone in Oz had used magic. All the time in the palace for little things, like polishing the silver or making the flowers in the garden grow a particularly vibrant shade. Ozma had magic, of course. Ozma was a fairy, but with the powers of Oz at her disposal. And Dorothy had power, too. The power to control the weather, set the seasons to her liking, bewitch the Scarecrow's weird experiments into more than just lifeless ideas strung together out of wood and wire. Though none of us really knew where Dorothy's power come from. Or if she had it in the other place. But what I'd done in Glinda's room was something different from the common household magic all servants shared. It was far more powerful and seemingly out of my control. I've never done anything like you've never done anything like that before? I don't think so, I said, and then stopped. I had done something like this once, before when I was a little girl. I'd been playing with some hand me down dolls that the other servants had given me. I was lonely. I was the only child in the palace, and one day I decided I wanted some real life friends, so I made my dolls come alive. I still don't know how I knew the magic to make that happen, but I do remember when Ozma walked in on me and my animated dolls. She instantly made them go back to being just stuffed animals, and she made me swear to never do that again and to never let anyone know that I could do something like that. I always wanted to make her happy, so I never tried to summon that kind of magic. I didn't want to upset Ozma. I'd always keep the extent of my magic a secret from everyone else in the palace. Adding a little extra shine to the silverware was no stretch for most Ozians, but ever since that day I knew that my own powers were different, and stronger, than anyone else in the palace, except Dorothy and Ozma. You're different, aren't you? Nox said, interrupting my revier. I didn't confirm his susp suspicions. He seemed to know with me without any, without saying anything. That must be why we... He cut himself off. Why what? And who's we? I promise I'll tell you everything when it's time, he said, but for now, you'll have to trust me. Right, I said, clear as mud. I sighed, annoyed, but whatever he knew, he wasn't going to tell me anything else now. You've had a long day, he said. Why don't you get some rest and you can get a fresh start tomorrow? He lowered his voice again. Whatever he, she says to you, whatever she lets you see, don't trust her, understand? She can act vulnerable, but it's just an act. 
Knox summoned another munchkin to show me to my room in the servants' quarters. It was tiny, like my room in Dorothy's, but it had none of the comforts of my room at home, where I'd spent my entire life. It was bleak and bare bones, with just a narrow bed, a low dresser, and a single small window that overlooked the palace gardens. The room was a stark reminder of how different my life was now, but at least here, I could be alone. Just the summer, I told myself again. I just have to make it through the summer. I collapsed on my bed, too exhausted to even change him out of my dress, and fell immediately to sleep.